This is TechZine Talks on Tour, the podcast about enterprise technology that brings you IT insights and analyses from events all around the globe. We cover everything, everywhere. Visit techzine.eu for more information. And don't forget to subscribe to this podcast. I'm here with Mike Beckley. He's the CTO and co-founder of, uh, of, of Appian. Mike, welcome. Great to see you again, Sander. Um, well, th th there's quite a bit of talk about what we call the AI economy or what you call the AI, AI, AI economy in a, in a recent press release. Um, I would like to talk a bit, bit more about that and it's especially about how organizations can adapt to that or have to, have to adapt to it um, or basically the underlying architecture that they need to adopt. So just first things first, but how real is the AI economy? What is it, right? Well, the AI economy is building on the digital economy that has become very real. So you think about the Internet of Things, you think about uh, concepts like behavior-based pricing already changing the insurance market. You think about that based on all of these sensors that are starting to permeate our life as Internet connectivity is now everywhere and our phones are everywhere. And uh, and so now there's sensors in your car, there's sensors in your home, and and uh, your thermostat, and all this is generating this whole avalanche of data that is being used to deliver better services and better experiences, uh, and also generating a lot of new workloads and opportunities that um, far exceed humans' ability to comprehend. Yeah. And so this is where AI is really being yeah. injected. And, and what, what does it what does it mean this this AI economy for for us as a society or as a as a as enterprises? Well, what the AI economy means is that there is a tremendous opportunity to uh, improve our operations, improve our decision making, improve the way we take care of our customers, and improve the way we take care of our employees. And that's because now a lot of information which was previously thrown away can actually be used because it can be used in real time. And that data is oftentimes worthless if it can't be used quickly, and it's, there's too much of it for humans to ever read. And that's the real truth of the AI economy today is that AI allows us to read vast amounts of information and get value from it right away. So, for example, in a, in a, a simple uh, case would be in, in universities and colleges. Mm -hmm. You have uh, a 50,000 student university system, a public university here in the United States that's using Appian AI uh, to help student advisors. We have a huge problem in this country and maybe in Europe with um, uh, students dropping out of university at higher rates than we've seen in a long time. We haven't really recovered as a society mm -hmm. from COVID. And, uh, and so the, the small group of student adv advisors, these adults whose job it is to help students succeed, have to go through mass amounts of information on these student files and an ever, number, ever increasing number mm -hmm. of student problems. And so Appian's data fabric can connect to more systems than ever to look at financial data and academic data and social data and behavior data. Yeah. But now they can summarize all that information with AI and so actually make an engaging outreach to the student that suggests that they actually might have something useful to say yeah. and, and a grown-up that they might actually trust to help solve a problem. Yeah. And so that's part, that's example of, of how the AI economy will work. I, I think you make an interesting point by referencing data fabric. Obviously, you would because you, you work <laughs> you, you work for Appian, and um, but I mean that, that leads me into the next question because this all sounds very good and, and very plausible. But I mean, obviously, you need to be able to, as an organization or as an institution or whatever you are, you need to be able to prepare yourself for this, right? To be able to use it because um, so what are the key components? I mean, not 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 necessarily only from your portfolio products? Sure, sure. But more in general, what are the key components for, for organizations to adopt this AI? Well, let me, let me say two things about that. The first is I think there's less preparation than people realize necessary uh, because of some other adva technology advances. But there is some, and the, the central point is AI is worthless without data, and it's uh, not very useful without a process to operationalize how you use those insights. Because AI on its own can do some parlor tricks, it can do some fun things, it can even improve your life a little bit. You know, it certainly will help students, um, you know, write term papers faster, whether or not that's a good thing or not. I'm not sure if the, <laughs> if the, if the contents of those term papers are very well, yeah. very good, but okay. Yeah. But, uh, but what it uh, can't do without human intervention is really deliver a lot of value. And that's why, for example, in my student advising example, which is real, mm -hmm. you know, it's, it's not making the decisions, it's 
summarizing the information and finding the information so that a human can make the right decision and make give the right advice. And, uh, and that's the state of AI today. But to do that well, you need to have the data prepared. And so some people argue that businesses aren't getting the value they need from AI and can't get the value they need from AI until they move all of their data into the cloud, until they modernize all their systems and, and uh, adopt new ERP systems, for example. And then they think there'll be this massive value you know, delivered from AI. Yeah. Well, there's certainly, it would certainly help, but I would argue technologies like Data Fabric, and there are other, other companies claim to have Data Fabrics too, so I assume they've decided that this is a necessary approach mm-hmm. as well, allow you to bring together data without waiting for it to be migrated into new systems. Yeah. And so that's why I see AI able to deliver value today. Well, obviously, there's also some sort of a self-serving part in this, right, for, uh, for companies to, to, to say you have to move your data to wherever oh, it goes. Because <laughs> yes, of course. If, you're, if your whole business yeah. is being paid to modernize ERP systems, you're going to say, you got to do that first before you get AI. Yeah. And I'm saying, well, you know, it wouldn't hurt, except for the fact that it's costly, expensive, and will take you, you know, many years. But it's years. hard, right, so. for companies or for organizations to, to decide when, when, when somebody says something to you that may not be entirely true, maybe it's not the right word, but I mean... Yeah, it's hard to sell in a, in a very noisy marketplace with a lot of ideas. Yeah. And you know, the good news here is there is so immediate, so much immediate value for some AI use cases uh, that these early pilot programs can be very promising. The uh, the problem is really more about how do you go from pilot to production? How do you scale up, and how do you see consistent results? Well, that would, that, that that reminds me of what we saw with big data, right? Mm-hmm. Lots of interesting oh, yes. pilots, but. Very, yeah. v- very little production. Right. Mm-hmm. And a lot of the early vendors in big data struggled yeah. uh, because it turns out that when you just pour lots of data into a data lake, you don't necessarily know how the data relates to each other. And you have a lot of data that doesn't work well with each other. Yeah. You know, and so um, that, that will happen again to some degree. But that's why we focus on trying to tell a story here about how AI is built on a pillar of data and process. And if you as an organization, say, all right, let's figure out what data we need we, we need because we have a certain hypothesis. We think we can use AI for predictive maintenance. Well, then we need some uh, sensor data on the things that might break. Mm-hmm. And once we have that data, we can then have a model trained. And then, then the question is, what do you do with that data? Okay, now you know your airplane is going to break. Now you know your car is going to break. But what do you do with that, uh, with that insight? Because actually... There's many different types of breakage, and some are serious, and some are not, and some should wait, and some should be not waited on. And so that's why you need process to yeah. operationalize how a human will take these inputs from the AI and decide what the right yeah. action and, is. And then in this example, you can take a sort of a risk-based approach to, to, to Precisely. this, Precisely. Right? Yes, exactly. Yeah. Um, I mean, and um, listening to Appian in the past couple of years talking about AI, there's also this distinction between public and private AI that you make quite a lot. Um, yeah. <laughs> I, I think I'm not exaggerating, but I mean that's uh, I've, I've heard it many times from uh, from 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 you and from uh, from Matt as well. Um, wh- why is that so important to make that distinction? Well, I think that uh, AI itself is so exciting, and that especially this new generative AI, ChatGPT. You know, it's the first time in in a long time people have suddenly immediately been able to experience something valuable from AI and something that feels like it could be even more valuable with a little bit more work. And so there's tremendous excitement, but that excitement can sometimes overcome the rational, reasonable, and legal requirements <laughs> to not spill data about your customers and, your, and spill your secrets when you ask a question. Are you actually asking a question which reveals sensitive data about your organization and your organization has contractual obligations to other organizations. And so private AI is about enterprise AI. It's about saying, okay, how do we as a society structure ourselves such that we inject AI into how our daily lives and our daily work in a way which protects us more as opposed to less? How do we um, not just comply with the EU's new privacy regulations, but how do we just do a better job of ensuring that people's personal information is protected and it's not abused? I think that's a key point there, right? Not, not just comply, but do, do, do the best you can, right? Exactly. And, and yeah. there's no reason why we can't t- take this moment of reflection and say, you know, the public AI is actually doing some real harm to creators, to artists, to musicians, uh, you know, to the people who make life interesting and magical. 
and we need to be careful we don't let that run amok and that the enterprises yeah. where we really profit from things are the key place to draw that hard line and say hey for enterprise ai it absolutely must be private but aren't you aren't you limiting the the use cases of ai in, 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 in to to a certain extent or in other words is it possible to um, to extend private ai be beyond your own four walls and, and and maybe referencing the i think it was called a strategic collaboration uh, w uh, agreement with uh, with aws so aws has partnered I, i'm sorry AW, uh, <laughs> aws and the strategic collaboration agreement with uh, amazon uh, is a, a great way to actually facilitate private ai because what Amazon does for us with their with their AI services is take many of different models that you can find in a public way, like the Claude models from Anthropic, and as well as Amazon's own Titan models. Now they have 23 now, I think, foundation models. And right, and, it, and there's a growing library there, and that will change over time. And we're able to deploy them privately for our clients, and so the this becomes the client's own model that they can fine tune, that they can work with and it put within their own security boundary so that their data never leaves their control. Yeah. So, so in that respect, you, got, you, you could argue that the, 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 the boundaries between public and private can, can be, you, you can make them disappear in, 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 this, in, in this way to a certain extent. What I can say is that uh, you can argue over where is the line of yeah. what is private. And when a, when a company creates a private cloud, with AWS, I think we've come as a society to accept that that is a mostly uh, secure, compliant, well-regarded barrier, and that um, that there are further levels you could go. You could say, I don't trust cloud vendors at all, and I'm going to run everything on my laptop and never let the world, never connect to the internet. But oh. you know, in our modern world, there's you know. What used to be considered on-premise is now considered self-managed. Yeah. You know, now because I, I'm trying to make the connection with the AI economy that we talked mm -hmm. about earlier, right? If you adopt that and you, if you embrace that, you need to also, you, you can't say, I'm, I'm going to keep everything on-premise. Or I'm, I'm, uh, I mean, it's it, it's maybe in some it's, in some niche use cases, but you, in in general, you need to embrace. That's well. You need to embrace access to the information. You don't need to embrace sharing your information with no, the rest no, of the world, no, no. and that's the difference. And and uh, and the AWS Strategic Collaboration Agreement makes it possible for us to bring private AI to a much bigger audience. Yeah, well, uh, I mean, th yeah. I, think, I think that's a good because when I listened to uh, to, to 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 the talk to all the all the talk about private AI last year, that didn't really seem feasible back then yet because it was so oh we uh, public bad uh, private good right obviously that's part of, of a sort of dialectic and you know <laughs> well what's on, happened <laughs> is that it it it's been quite feasible and it's forced many of the previously public ai vendors to invest heavily in security and privacy controls oh. and everyone's had to come to terms with this fact that you know the the public ai is is really limited even OpenAI has an enterprise offering where they're making many of the sim, sim, similar sounding private AI promises now. No. So I, I think that it, this advocacy of private AI has been nothing but good. Now, it's still on the consumer, buyer beware, how much privacy am I getting? Yep. Where is my data going? Validating the security boundaries and the, the, the security controls, certainly. So, so it, it's not a not necessarily a technical discussion, uh, because if, I, if for, for example, if I, would, I were to ask you, are we there yet? We're probably not, right? We, we're not there yet with extending private AI all the way, all the way to, uh, to the end-to-end -end processes. Maybe it, it, technically it's possible. But well, we, we're we, definitely extending private AI to end-to-end -to -end yeah. processes today. That's in production and real. The question is, what I think you were getting at is, what other use cases that might require public AI are we not able to address? Yes. And there... I, I don't know. I would have to be presented with something that I haven't seen yet to say. No, and mean, I'm sure there are. I'm so sure there's good. something out there. There, there's, um, you know, there's significant interest in you know training public AIs on the world's data, and those are a I issues where if you get past copyright, which is a big issue to get past, and I don't know if you can, but if you could, there would be some value in combining public AI with private AI. But you'd want to go from the direction of uh, less security to more security, not the other direction. So just because yeah. there's a bridge doesn't mean we can't bring in insights from the public world into a private world, combine yeah. it with a private insight, and keep that new insight private. Yeah. 
So and 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 looking looking a little bit forward, what's the um um and we already talked about the the architecture or the components that you need, and you you mentioned that it, it, it it's not necessarily very difficult. Uh, no, it, it's a human element that 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 needs to. Well, this is what things. all of the low-code vendors like Appian are trying to do for you. We're trying to eliminate the need for you to have to know how to program a database. We're trying to eliminate the need for you to have to know how to program iOS and Android to build mobile apps. We're trying to eliminate the need for you to write HTML, CSS, and JavaScript for web apps. And now we are uh, going a long way. We have seen the industry in trying to eliminate the need for you to be a data scientist and an AI expert. Because each new large language model comes with a book-length uh, set of instructions for how to prompt it, how to ask questions oh. of it. What prompts does it accept? Does it understand XML tags? Which XML tags does it understand? What will it do with those tags? What output can you expect? And you know, therefore, what output can you program into your application? And so that changes all the time. And every new version, even from the same vendor, changes oh. so quickly. This industry is moving so fast that relying on, on just an Appian's example, I can't speak for the other low codes, now you can embed our private LLM and trust that we will keep enhancing it. We'll keep changing it, and your app will keep working. Yeah. That's our job, to translate your question in natural language into prompts that work. Well, and so before we yeah. upgrade it, we have to upgrade our prompts. Yeah. Well, it's going to be interesting to see how you, how you solve the, the potential problem that I see, at least. Maybe I haven't thought it through enough. But, uh, of, uh, for example, if you, if, for the, if you do, it, uh, if you do the, 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 uh, the connection with Bedrock, right? So yes. with the Amazon Bedrock. Uh, obviously, if you use Claude Sonnet or or the other one, so there's a big one and a small one. I forgot the other's name. Yeah, but yeah I mean, Claude Instant and Claude, yeah, yeah. That, yeah. That doesn't that doesn't matter. Um, uh, how do you make sure that your customers aren't going overboard in terms of cost? Ah, because if yes, you if you, yeah. if you use uh, if you, you can say well if you use this model you can do lots of interesting stuff, but then at the end of the month they will get the bill and say oh. And that's not really what, what, I was, what I signed up for. Yes, yes, of course. So Appian has, for the moment, uh, provided uh, different pricing tiers, which include significant consumable there. Uh, and so that, that we're really taking away the risk from the customer in many ways. And uh, we'll see how that evolves. Uh, but we're also providing the tooling. Again, when you, instead of just having your data scientists guess what the users will do, you know, Appian's whole methodology is to make it low code so you can have the users as a part of the design and you can have much better forecasting of what kind of demand you'll have. Yeah. And we're giving you the tools to better monitor the usage so that you can make more intelligent decisions more quickly about yeah. you know, how much consumption of these you know, services are you willing to, to bear and what value. Yeah. And, what, and more important, with, yeah. with process mining, with now our new process HQ, sorry for the commercial here, but <laughs> again, there's a reason for this. We talk about the AI economy. There's a velocity here that's increasing where people are going to you know, use more of this AI service the more valuable it is. And we see that creating an exponential increase in consumption and an in increase in com processes that are flowing through your system. So we're giving you the tools to automatically mine those processes yeah. and measure their value and their cost that's so that you yeah, can make better predictions about what do you want to invest yeah. in and prioritize what automations you're willing to spend money on and which ones you want to retire because they're just they're not returning the yeah. ROI the return on investment you expect uh, to, to a certain extent this this sounds a lot like so what, what, what's now very hip and happening in the open source world is platform engineering right yes so it very much is so platform this, engineering this is yeah. basically what you do well but again, you, and you've been doing it for a long time apparently right. yes but and <laughs> it's it's low code platform yeah. engineering yeah. you know there's the expensive way to do platform engineering which is hire a bunch of brilliant developers build a platform and maintain it and uh, and then create services that you're you know customers and dev teams and app teams yeah. can use or you can adopt a platform yeah. and there there are competitors to Appian and and they're all doing this platform engineering yeah, and, like and we especially are. if you do it like this I mean from where I'm standing at least then the, the cost is, the, the cost issue is also something that you can actually harness in in the platform itself and you can say well, correct yes if you use it like this you will never go overboard with your cost and you can meter and cap things eventually and have true technology business management that would be the direction yeah, I'd yeah, see yeah, us yeah. heading yeah yeah. Well, and and then and then finally, um, what, what's the? I've 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 heard I've heard that you, you you're quite you're quite fond of some of of, of a new technology. Uh, that's the next step, and it also has it also has a very important imp impact on 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 AI, right? It's called elastic process yeah. execution. If Epics, I'm Epics, yes, as an elastic process execution. Yeah. Uh, this is a new um, a new architecture, and and I like to talk about it because it it doesn't rely on AI. 
And uh, there, I want people to remember that there's still a lot of innovation happening in the economy that is not explicitly AI. But the demand for epics is in no small part being created by AI and the Internet of Things and, and um, digital twins and, and uh, the, the massive increase in data that we're drowning so, in. So, so briefly, what, what, does it, what does it do? So the epics architecture allows Appian to go from supporting millions of processes a day to billions. It's a, a complete reimagining of, of how we actually manage tasks, task queues, and execute processes in, a, uh, in an all-new uh, design that is very lightweight, very efficient. So the processes you're running today could run with a lot less compute and therefore save energy, save the earth. And as you have to scale up your compute demands to support all of these new AI-generated queries and AI-generated responses and AI-generated workloads, that uh, you'll be able to keep up with and stay ahead of that demand yeah. without having to hire an army of people. And, and, and the goal is to build it on top of your existing uh, architecture, on top yeah. of data, data, data fabric com combined with Process HQ. The Precisely. Entire... And then you can have generated AI services. But the important thing here is that customers who already use Appian don't need to have any problem with backwards compatibility. They use the same tools they're familiar with, the same modeling environment, And now Epix is a switch. You throw it, and your process can scale up and down elastically. Okay. <clears throat> well, should be should be interesting. I, I will look forward to. Uh, to uh, so, w w when are you going to do this? Uh, so it's, <laughs> is, it's, it's already a it's, it's already <laughs> it's already been done. It's in beta now. We've been beta testing it with customers all year, oh. and uh, you can contact us to sign up for the beta program yourself. And it is uh, incredibly powerful. We we were showing off some great feedback from from uh, customers who are already working with it and oh. have already seen results of up to 15 times more scalability. I look forward to uh, seeing it in action uh, s someday. And uh, well, and you ended with a commercial pitch again, so maybe, oh, maybe people will call you, you never know. <laughs> Sorry about well, that. No, no it's fine, it's fine. <laughs> uh, so uh, thank you for the, uh, for the nice conversation. Uh, I think uh, uh, the listener is, uh, is much wiser now about the AI economy, hopefully, if he's listened to well or she. Uh, so thanks again. Yeah, thanks looking for coming to Appian World, Sander. Yeah. Look forward to seeing looking you again soon. Yeah, looking forward to it next time. Thanks so much for tuning in to this episode of Tech Scene Talks on Tour. If you're enjoying the show, please feel free to rate, subscribe, and leave a review wherever you listen to your podcasts. That helps others find the show, and we greatly appreciate it. If you'd like more information, please feel free to visit techzine.eu, where we cover everything, everywhere. Thanks again for listening, and we hope you'll join us again on the next episode of Tech Scene Talks on Tour.